Olá pessoal, aqui é o André Faria, sou diretor de tecnologia da Bluesoft e eu quero te convidar a conhecer o Acelerato para você poder organizar melhor o seu backlog e acompanhar a evolução do seu projeto num Kanban virtual. Entre agora mesmo em acelerato.com e crie a sua conta. Aproveite o papo reto. Alright, sorry I only speak a little bit of Portuguese, so this is going to be in English, but no worries, I understood most of what you said if you were interviewed by Mauricio today. Understanding is easier than speaking. Um, so I want to talk about a tool that um, I developed uh, over the last two, three years when I was still in Canada. Um, and the talk is mostly about software documentation. I don't know if most of you are old enough to remember when software documentation looked like this. And uh, back then the main problem was that there was no software documentation, right? Software documentation was really hard to find. Maybe IBM had published this one book like in 1985, but in general software documentation was really hard to find. That was the main challenge for software documentation. And so really the case anymore. We did a small study a couple of years ago where we put um, each API method of the jQuery API into Google, like this, jQuery Add, jQuery Ajax, and so on. And we looked at the top 10 results that Google returned just to see where is software documentation these days? What do software developers look at? For 99% of the API methods, the official jQuery API uh, documentation came up, so that was sort of expected. For one of them it didn't work, I don't remember why, but the vast majority, you know, the official documentation. But then there's also lots of results on blogs. So for 88% of all the um, API methods of the jQuery API, there was at least one blog post among the top 10 search results on Google. This is data I think that's like three, four years old, so who knows, it might be even more now. So that's blogs. Then there's Stack Overflow, of course. At the time it was with 84%. All kinds of other semi-official websites, so for example, the W3 schools, um, forums, and so on. So there's, for example, the jQuery forum. So there's lots of documentation out there. And maybe one would think that it's very easy to find documentation. But um, on the next couple of slides, I have a few counter examples that show that despite all this documentation that's out there, it's still difficult to find the documentation we're really looking for. Uh, the small example I have here is about threads in Java. I'm sure some of you must be familiar with threads in Java, you know, concurrency and all that. So let's assume our task is we want to prevent threat interference. We're developing something, we have one thread here, one thread there, and they are somehow interfering and we don't know what's going on. So we search Google for how to, um, how to prevent threat interference. So the first challenge here is that we want to talk about threat interference, but in the official documentation, this thing is called concurrency. So that's what's called a vocabulary gap. So the words that we use to describe our problem, threat interference, aren't the same words that the person who wrote the documentation used to describe the solution. So the first challenge is we need to know that what we're looking for is actually called concurrency, which you know most of you will probably know, but that's one of the first challenges. Um, usually people use autocomplete to help with that. So autocomplete is usually designed to help with this kind of vocabulary gap. You start typing something and Google or whatever other search engine will sort of suggest things that you might be looking for. Well in this case it doesn't work too well, prevent thread worms and thread veins and deadlock in C sharp and so on. So it doesn't always work that well. But fair enough, if we search exactly for Java, prevent threat interference, we come to an article called Threat Interference on the official Java website. So now you would think we found everything we were looking for. This is what the website looks like, wonderful, right? However, if we look at the text in a bit more detail, we see here the last sentence, blah blah blah, interference between threads may prevent this from happening as expected. So what we wanted to know is how to prevent threat interference. What the website tells us is that threat interference prevents something else. It doesn't actually tell us how to prevent threat interference. 
So even though the words are all on that website, it doesn't answer our question. So this was the first hit on Google, doesn't help. So now one possible explanation for this could be, well, maybe there is no documentation on how to prevent threat interference on the official Oracle documentation. So maybe it just doesn't exist. But that's not the case. If we look in more detail, there's a section on synchronized methods. And the first sentence there says, synchronized methods enable a simple strategy for preventing threat interference. Beautiful. This is what we ideally wanted. And there's even more. There's another one on atomic variables that says, blah, 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 allows us to prevent threat interference without and so on. So all this documentation is there. Google just doesn't find it. And that's where our research tool came in. I'm just going to talk about the basic idea, but there's going to be a tool demo as well. That's why we needed to set up this laptop instead of just any laptop. <laughs> um, so the very basic idea is we take a corpus of documentation, so for example the official Java documentation, but it could also be the documentation from you guys, it could be the official Spring documentation and so on. We take a corpus of documentation and we extract using natural language processing, and I'll show you a few examples on how we do this. We extract tasks from this documentation and then we suggest these tasks in an autocomplete interface. And I'll come back to each of these steps over the next few slides. So a very simple example. Let's say we have a sentence that looks like this. This can be used to generate a receipt or some other confirmation. This is, by the way, from the official Django um, documentation. So this works for Python stuff as well. This isn't Java specific. This can be used to generate a receipt or some other confirmation. What are the tasks that people have in mind that should lead them to the sentence. Generate receipt and generate other confirmation. Those are the two tasks that are described in the sentence. If we want to know how to generate a receipt, we should look at the sentence and probably the sentence before and the sentence after. And if we want to generate something else, we might also want to look at it. So how do we get these tasks out of the sentence? Well, we use something that's called natural language processing. Um, the state-of-the-art tool comes out of Stanford at this point. So if we put a sentence like this can be used to generate a receipt, some other confirmation into a state-of-the-art natural language processing tool, it does all kinds of things. So the first thing is it uh, creates what we call part-of-speech tags. So for example, it identifies the word generate as a verb because it's an action, right? We can generate something. So generate is a verb. Um, receipt as a noun, other is an adjective, and so on. You have these things in Portuguese as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we go a step further. You can also look at the connections between words. So in this case, confirmation is the direct object of the verb generate. Because we generate, but what do we generate? A confirmation. And we have the same direct object relationship here again. So we have generate receipt as one direct object relationship and generate confirmation as another one. So just by putting this into a state-of-the-art natural language processing tool, we were able to extract these two tasks from this sentence. And those are actually the tasks that this sentence describes. It's not always quite this easy. So this sentence is in passive voice, so that's a different example. The thumbnail size is set in your templates. There's not a single direct object relationship in the sentence, so it doesn't work. But what we do have is another relationship because we have passive voice here. So instead of saying, you set the thumbnail size by doing this, it uses passive voice here, the thumbnail size is set. So then we can use this relationship and we get a task that says set size. Now set size is not very useful, right? If I tell you you have to set size tomorrow morning first thing, you will have no idea what, what I'm talking about, right? Because there are lots of sizes, lots of things you could set. So we use a few other relationships as well. So if we also look at the adjective that belongs to size, we get a a bit more of a concrete task. So now we have set thumbnail size. Okay, that's a bit more interesting. And we can also look at the prepositions, this one here, and then we have a more complete task that says set 
uh, set thumbnail size in templates. Okay, so now it's a lot more concrete. I'm not going to go through all the uh, technical details here. I think in total we follow nine different of these dependencies to create these tasks. These are sort of the two most basic examples. Um, just a few other words about some of the heuristics we use. Um, so one problem is if we use this passive relationship that I just told you about, we also get tasks like this one. So we have a passive relationship from the verb use to the word this, which would account for a task, use this. Okay, again, first thing you have to do tomorrow morning is use this. You know, it's a completely meaningless task. And another example, if you have a, a sentence such as, this page contains information, the task would be contain information. Again, this isn't something you would do, right? As a developer, you never want to contain information. <laughs> So then we use a bunch of heuristics to get rid of these problems. So we have a, a blacklist that automatically excludes tasks that have the word this, that, it, he, she, all of these very generic things in it. So we make sure we get rid of those. And in the same way, we have a list of verbs, about 200, uh, that we call programming actions. So things like add, delete, remove, modify, all the things you do on a daily basis. Contain isn't one of them, so we get rid of that one as well. There are a few more heuristics involved. Um, I can point you to a, like a technical article that we wrote about this stuff if you're interested in the details. But uh, I think I'll move on to the tool demo now. So just a summary, we take a corpus of documentation, we extract these tasks from it, and then we suggest the tasks in an autocomplete interface. Demo time. Where's my browser? There's my browser. So the tool is called TaskNav. Um, so let's use the example with the thread interference. So now if I start typing thread, it already comes up with all kinds of things to do with threads. So I could manage a thread object, I could return thread interrupted, I could call threads, execute threads, and so on. But I want to do something with thread interference, so I type a little bit more. I just need to type thread and in and prevent thread interference is the top suggestion here. I select it, and it suggests the screen resolution usually is a bit bigger than this. Um, it suggests three different articles of the Java documentation, one on synchronization, synchronized methods, and atomic variables. And if I select one of the search results, it automatically should get me exactly to the part of the documentation that describes my tasks. So I wanted to prevent threat interference. It automatically highlights the part that tells me that a simple idiom that can effectively prevent threat interference and memory consistency errors. So the nice thing is, because we use these tasks to index documentation at a sentence level, unlike Google, we can actually bring you to the sentence that answers your question. We don't just get you to the website, we get you to the specific sentence. So the tool automatically scrolls down and highlights the sentence in yellow. Just to show it works for others as well. So this is the section on synchronized methods. Yeah, there we are. Synchronized methods enable a simple strategy for preventing threat interference. Or the atomic variable example. There we are. Um, where's the preventing threat interference? Somewhere down here. Allows us to prevent threat interference without resorting to synchronization and so on. So it works pretty well. Um, maybe just another quick example. So, for example, if we type time zone, if we can type, if we type time zone in here, it suggests all kinds of tasks that have something to do with the time zone. So, how do we support one time zone from another time zone? How do we describe time zone? How do we specify time zone? Include time zone, use default time zone, and so on. So, maybe we'll look for how to use the default time zone what happens there we are so somewhere in there it should say using the default time zone yes using the using the of instant method and the default time zone and then there's a code example that except that explains what's going on
So what I want you to take away from this as well, for one, documentation is everywhere, as I'm sure you know. Uh, but it is harder to find than sometimes you would expect. You know, Google doesn't always work that well. So, and that's why what we did in this approach is we tried to extract these development tasks from the documentation and then use them in this tool to navigate the documentation. Okay, if you have questions, you can obviously ask me now or that's my Twitter handle. Okay, thanks for listening. Thank you. One yeah. How long does the tool take to parse the recommendation? Um, so if it would be one of the little Java things, like just a Java exception, I could probably have done this live with like five minutes or so. Uh, the natural language processing part takes a while, but that's just an out-of-the-box tool. We needed to customize it a little bit because um, that's one of the challenges I didn't really talk about. Let's see if we have a I'm not even sure if I have an example on the slides anymore. Um, but one of the challenges is that a lot of the um, code terms that we use, you know, like the, the include tag and things like that, um, the standard natural language tools don't know them. So if you talk about, for example, the include tag in Python, you know, the, the parser sees the word include and thinks, oh, it must be a verb, right? Whereas the include tag is actually a noun because it's a, it's a concept, it's a programming concept. So we did a bit of customization of the natural language parser to make sure that all the common code words or everything that's in camel case, for example, and so on, that those things get automatically tagged as a noun. So, and because of these uh, customizations, the natural language processing is slower than it would be otherwise. But yeah, if it would be just one part of the Java documentation, like the exception handling part or the date time part or whatever, five, maybe ten minutes at most. Yeah. Do you rely on a specific kind of documentation like Java doc or no. it can be anything? No. no, actually in the online version we have uh, Spring, I think, at this point, the uh, Spring documentation, which might be more relevant to you guys actually. Um, the first prototype we did was just a random Python documentation of a small web development startup that was like written by them. Yeah. So what we do, what we use internally are text files. So if you can give me a text file, this tool can do it. And we have some standard stuff now that turns this kind of HTML into the text file. But if you can do that for another HTML format, then we can parse it. For now, the only natural language is English, right? That's true. Um, I actually presented a short paper, um, when was that, last month, two months ago, at a software engineering conference here in Brazil on some of the challenges around parsing uh, Portuguese software documentation. And it's actually quite difficult because, uh, for one, the parsers aren't as good. So at the time we evaluated two so-called state-of-the-art Portuguese parsers, but they are by far not as good as the Stanford tooling for English, so that was one problem. And the other one is when you write software documentation in Portuguese, so there are lots of code elements in it, of course, but there are also lots of English words in it yeah. because you use English to refer to a lot of these things. So um, what we did for this small study was, do you guys know there's a Portuguese version of Stack Overflow? pt.stackoverflow.com. So we uh, took the 100 question titles from the highest rated questions and just put them into these parsers just to see what would happen. Less than 20% of them were tagged correctly. 80% of those question titles had some problem just because and yeah they were really difficult ones some of them. You know in Portuguese qual a diferença entre if and e else or something like that. <laughs> so the parser really needs to know word by word, is this English, is it Portuguese or is it source code? So it becomes really difficult. So as of now, no, <laughs> but I've sort of started working on it. Yeah, it's still in the early stages for Portuguese, yeah. Uh, 